You know, there are some things that experts predict won't happen that do happen. And it becomes so commonplace in our lives and our society that we can't even imagine that somebody with brains would have ever said this wouldn't happen. Let me give you a couple examples. Let's take Lee DeForest, for example. He invented what's known as a cathode ray tube, which is very integral to the, you know, the invention of the television. But listen to what he said about television. He said, theoretically, television may be feasible, but I consider it an impossibility, a development which we should waste little time dreaming about. Or let's talk about Thomas Watson, the chairman of the board of IBM. In 1943, Thomas said this. He said, I think there is a world market for about five computers. Now, some of you have five computers in your house, <laughs> let alone thinking about a world market for five computers. Or how about these words by a record producer in the entertainment business? He said this, he said, we don't think the Beatles will do anything in their market. I mean, guitar groups are on their way out. Now, those so-called experts could not have been more wrong with their predictions. See, what's that have to do with our conversation on end times? Well, there are a lot of people out there, even in the days of the apostles, who were laughing and scoffing at Christians, saying, Jesus is never going to come back. There are a lot of people today that don't believe there's going to be a literal return of Christ. Even progressive Christians that just say, you know, we admire the humanity of Jesus. It is something for us to emulate, but we doubt his deity or there are those who just deny his deity as well. How about you? Do you believe that in your lifetime or thereafter, at some point in the future, Christ is going to return. The king will return. The creator will renew his creation. There are some people who cannot imagine the world being much different than it is right now. But we know that God says it is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And so my question is, do you believe that? Do you believe that what we're waiting for really is going to happen someday? Well, welcome back to the fourth message in our series, what in the world is going on? And we're looking at the words of Jesus about the future, <clears throat> words that he spoke while on the Mount of Olives talking to his disciples. Remember, he upset them when he let them know that the temple was going to be destroyed and Jerusalem was going to be ransacked. They could not imagine. I mean, this is the largest sanctuary of its kind in the ancient world. The complex of buildings, the Temple Mount, took over 42 years to build, and they were still being worked on. It occupied 35 acres. They could not imagine that it would all come tumbling down. So they wanted to know from Jesus, when will your words be fulfilled? And then they wanted to know two things. What will be the sign that the temple is going to be destroyed? And what will be the sign that your coming back and the world is going to end. Remember, they thought that it was simultaneous. It would happen one right after the other. And you and I, we've been behaving like good detectives. We've been trying to figure out what of Jesus' words apply to his prophecy about the destruction of the temple, which we know happened about 43 year, uh, 40 years later in 70 AD. And what of his words applies to the future that we are still waiting on? Let's summarize it, draw a little diagram if you want to with me. We'll imagine that this line stands for time. We'll start our timing at the cross. Jesus died on the cross. We know that he was buried in the tomb. We know that he rose again from the dead, and we know that he ascended to the Father. We know that in 70 AD, his prophecy about the destruction of the temple took place. It actually happened and we know that somewhere out here in the future, Jesus is going to return again. We know that he has told us there are going to be a lot of things that happen between this point, his ascension, and this point, his return. And some of these things should not alarm us. They're just part of history. They're non-signs. They are events. So, for instance, Jesus said, expect, now I'll use initials here, false messiahs. Expect wars and rumors of wars. He said to expect earthquakes. 
He said to expect famines. He said to expect persecution. He said to expect tribulation, small t, meaning it's just happening all the time. And then it appears in Scripture there will be an intense time of tribulation, about seven years that takes place when the Antichrist emerges, etc., and then Christ will return. Throughout this entire age, the gospel, the good news, is to be preached to the whole world. And those are some of the things that we have covered and talked about. So with this picture in mind, this kind of a summary of where we've been, what I want to do is I want to pick up with a passage of Scripture that we actually began looking at last weekend together. Here's the words of Jesus. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now let's stop there and let's kind of work through these passages together. I want you to think about this phrase immediately after the tribulation of those days. There are some Bible scholars who believe in the second coming of Jesus. That's not a problem for them. But who look at the words of Jesus and what we've been calling the Olivet Discourse and say that those words were really being applied to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and have very little to do with when he returns. Now, I disagree with those scholars. And uh, I, I look at what other eminent uh, theologians and scholars say, that yes, there are some words that apply to 70 AD, but there are words here because remember they asked the second question, what's the sign of your return and the end of the world? There are words here that are addressing that issue. So on the one hand, the immediacy that Jesus speaks of, I believe, does have to do with destruction of 70 AD. But it also foreshadows the immediacy after what we think of as a great tribulation takes place. At the end of time, Christ is going to return as well. So we have to kind of look at it in both lenses. Now you'll understand why some scholars think it only applies to 70 AD as we keep working in the passage. So for instance, when Jesus describes this uh, cosmic chaos that takes place, the moon not giving its light, you know, the sun going out and the stars being shaken, scholars who say, look, this applies only to 70 AD will remind us that in the Old Testament, God oftentimes uses hyperbole to describe Nations that come against nations and, and destroy those other nations. What I mean by that is that in the Bible, God sometimes uses a nation to punish another nation. He used Babylon, for instance, to punish Judea. But then, because Babylon became so arrogant, God used the Medes and Persians to punish Babylon. And in Isaiah chapter 13, we get a taste for this hyperbolic language because we hear in Isaiah the prophecy that the Medes and the Persians are going to beat up on the Babylonians and it is described as though it were the end of the world. So just listen to these words in Isaiah chapter 13. It says, For the stars of heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. Sounds very familiar to what Jesus is saying, doesn't it? I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I'll put an end to pomp the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. I'll make people more rare than fine gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Sounds like the end of the world. And you know, in those days, for those nations, when they were being conquered by an invading, an invading country, it felt like the end of the world. And I am sure that in 70 AD, when Titus and the Roman army came in and plundered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, it had to have felt like the end of the world. However, while you can see it that way and, and apply it that way, for instance, in the Old Testament or even in 70 AD, right? The truth is, this also is foreshadowing the future and the literal end of the world. You know, the early Christians interpreted this passage, scholars tell us, as being very literal for the end of time and the end of the world. Remember this. While some things are possible, they're not always probable. Just because something's hyperbolic in the Old Testament, there's no rule that says that in the New Testament it has to be the same way. 
It is possible it only applies to 70 AD, but it's not probable. It is possible that here in Minnesota in February, we will be enjoying the 70s in terms of weather and temperature, but it is not probable. If you've ever lived in Minnesota, you know that. We pray for it, but it's not probable. So I think what we have here is, is yes, there's a description of 70 AD, but this is really going to be literally fulfilled, a literal shaking of the heavens and the earth when Jesus returns. All right, so let's, let's move on in our passage of Scripture. He says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Let's stop there. Now, a lot of us would read that and say, well, that, that's, that's the future. How can you say that applies to 70 AD? If you say that applies to 70 AD, it means that Jesus got it wrong, which is what progressive Christians like to say about Jesus. He wasn't perfect. He got some things wrong. He's good to emulate, but we can't trust everything he says. And if, boy, if you take that mindset, then you can pretty much dismiss a lot of things you don't like that Jesus said. So is Jesus right or was he wrong? Well, the godly good scholars who believe this only applies to 70 AD will tell us that here we go again. Jesus is borrowing some words from the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 7, and this is actually describing him ascending to his father and receiving the nations as an inheritance and the, the kingdom that will never be destroyed. It sounds a lot like what Daniel said in chapter 7. Let me read to you what he said and listen to, and then think about the words that Jesus spoke. Daniel said in chapter 7, verse 13, I saw the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed." Sounds very much like the same thing, but it's two, two different situations. Daniel's describing Jesus ascending, coming before the Father after he's accomplished his work on the cross and receiving the inheritance of the nation and all the peoples. What Jesus describes here is not coming to heaven, not coming to the Father, but coming to the earth. In fact, he says, all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see him coming. We don't have all the nations of the earth watching Jesus receive the kingdom in heaven, so to speak. And there's no mourning. There's a celebration with that. So this clearly, in my mind, is speaking about the future. And again, the early Christians saw it being interpreted that way. <clears throat> now, let's continue on in our passage of Scripture. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. Keep an eye on this trumpet, okay? Okay. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So let's stop there for a moment. question is, is that the rapture? And the answer to the question is, yes, that is the rapture. The question, though, is, as we said before, is it the rapture happening before the great tribulation at the end? Is it the rapture happening in the middle of the great tribulation? Or is it the rapture at the end of the tribulation? I believe it's the rapture at the end of the tribulation. And I'll tell you why. There are not multiple comings of Jesus. There's no first coming, secret coming, taking and rapturing us away while the world goes to tribulation, and then a second coming of Jesus. It's all one coming. And you'll see that in just, just a moment, all right? Let's go back to our passage. Look what he says. He says, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. Let's stop there. I think what Jesus is doing here is he's going back to the original question. Can you give us a sign when the temple is going to be destroyed? And now he's giving them that sign. Jesus says, you all know, you live here, that when the fig leaf, you know, when the fig tree gets its leaf and the blossoms start, you can almost predict to the week when the fruit is going to be ready to harvest. It's that, it's that common sense. It's, it's, it's this sign. He says, now let me give you a sign. I think it's what he's saying. Uh, when Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. He goes on, he says, so also when you see all these things, all right, you know that he is near. Now, here's what's really interesting. It is difficult to interpret the word that you see from the 
ESV version here as he, okay? The actual interpretation can also be it. It could be he, she, or it. If you go to the NIV, it will say when you see these things happen, you know that it is near. So it's up to the translator. They look at the context to decide, is it he or is it it? Some translators look at it, they have a bias, and they say, well, I think this, this is what it all means, so I'm going to put he. Others look at it and say, no, from the context, I think it is it. I believe it is it. It is near. What is near? The destruction of Jerusalem is near. Not the coming of Christ. All right, but again, it depends how you're seeing this happen, okay? 70 AD or the future. Or one and a foreshadowing of the other. Nothing for us to get hung up on, but just to understand sometimes the tension of trying to interpret these things, which makes prophecy sometimes kind of hard to, to understand and figure out. That's why we hold it so loosely, okay? So Jesus says, so also when you see all these things, you know that it or he is near at the very gates. Well, we go down the passage of Scripture and Jesus says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. What are all these things? The things we've been talking about. And he says, this generation, whenever Jesus uses that New Testament, he's talking about the generation that's alive when he's there. It is is his contemporary, so to speak. He's saying, some of you are going to be alive when it is. Is near. In other words, some of you will be alive, and they were alive when Titus and the Roman legions showed up to take down the temple and Jerusalem. And Jesus warned them when you hear their coming and see their coming, get out of the city. Luke chapter uh, 21, verse 20. When the soldiers surround Jerusalem, you better get out, or it's going to be too late. And if God doesn't cut short those days, nobody would survive. And we've talked about that already. So that's the picture of of what's going on here. He's answering that question about the temple. And then then he springs ahead. He says, now let me tell you something about the future. And what he's about to say to them is, look, I can give you you a sign about 70 AD, but I can't give you a sign like that about the future. He says, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In other words, I'm telling you the truth. But, okay, but concerning that day, so let's talk now about the future. Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So in other words, Jesus is saying is, I can, I can give you a clue about 70 AD. I can give you some signs to watch for. But now I don't even know in my humanity here on earth, I don't even know when God is going to say, time's up. Go get your children. And so Jesus kind of leaves us kind of hanging there, knowing that all the while as we wait, we're to be faithful to him, faithful to his word and faithful to his mission believing that what he says is going to happen, that his predictions will actually take place. Now let's look at some more passages of Scripture here, okay? Jesus goes on, he says, immediately after the tribulation of these days, we've been there already, okay? I want you, I, I want you to hear this because we're not going to talk about the rapture, and I've got to stitch some passages together, Okay? Immediately after tribulation these days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then it will appear in the heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now let's go to First Thessalonians and listen to what Paul has to say, because it fits right in with what Jesus just said, and it's going to give us an understanding of what Jesus meant. For this we declare, Paul says, to you by a word from the Lord. So this is, this is something Paul receives from Jesus. He received it in God's seminary of the wilderness, 
right? He was in the wilderness for two years, the deserts of Arabia. He tells us that in Galatians 1, where the Lord personally spoke to him and taught him. Paul is writing this letter, these words, before the Gospels were written. So this predates what, the, what you know, Matthew and Mark and Luke put down. So keep in mind what Jesus said. Now keep in mind what Paul's saying, that we who are alive, Paul and many of the New Testament believers thought Jesus would return in their lifetime, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, remember the words of Jesus, will not precede those who have fallen asleep, those who die. For the Lord himself will descend, Jesus already said that, from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a what? Here we go. Jesus already talked about this trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then he says, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, if you take what Jesus said and then what Paul says and put them together, you don't have two comings of Christ. You have one coming of Jesus. In fact, Paul will write later on to the Corinthians these words. Listen, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when that last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will be transformed, for our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. See, when you put those passages together, it's, it's one event that's being described for us here. So if I were to draw it out for you, sketch it out, it would look something like this. We create our timeline again. We'll start with the cross. We know we've got 70 AD out here someplace. All right, people die. They've been dying ever since, right? So we'll imagine this is a grave, okay? This is a believer who's died. All right, their spirit goes to be the Lord, their bodies are here, okay? Let's imagine that you're alive when Christ returns. This represents the return of Jesus. Paul says, because the, because the Thessalonians were saying what in the world is going on, they were being told that Jesus had already come and they'd been left behind. Paul says, no, 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 no. When Jesus comes, you're going to know it. Jesus said, when I come, the whole world's going to know it. There's no mistake, there's no secret. Paul says what will happen is, first of all, the dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are alive are going to join them and be transformed together. And we will meet him in the air. Now, the word that Paul uses for meeting the Lord in the air was a Greek term that was used when a king approached a city. The inhabitants of the city would go out and greet the king as a courtesy and escort him into the city. They didn't go out and greet the king, and the king took them away someplace and came back seven years later. They went out, they met him, and they came. And so the picture here is we are transformed. Why? Because we're now going to come with him, all right? And when we come with him, it is to come and rule and reign with him, and then you have the millennium that follows afterwards. Now, I believe that is the scenario that we are to look forward to, Okay? Now, keep in mind that we read earlier that when the Lord comes, the angels, it says, will gather people from the four corners of the earth and bring them to him. So somehow, and I don't understand the mystery of this, the angels are involved in bringing us to the Lord, dead bodies joining the spirits that come from the Lord who've been with him in paradise, those who are still alive being also brought up. Keep that in mind because there's a very unique passage of Scripture found in Matthew chapter 13. L listen to the words of Jesus. <clears throat> he says, Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers. 
and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So the angels evidently, there's, there's two harvests that are going on here, right? There's the harvest of the believers who are transformed, who come to reign. And there's also the harvest of the unbelievers who are brought into judgment. Now, let me say this quickly. This is, again, why many progressive Christians want to, want to dumb Jesus down, want to find fault in what he says, want to say, oh, he was wrong. Therefore, if we can believe that, we can change other things. They don't like this idea of judgment in hell. But let me say this. I've said it before. God is not going to send somebody to hell against their, against their will. In other words, those who go to hell go there because that's where they want to be. That's where they want to go. They don't want God. They reject Christ. They want an eternity without God. So they're consigned. They get what they want. They get a world without God. And when you live in a world without God, as I said before, you turn into a monster. Because you don't have his truth. You don't have his guide. You don't have his compass. You don't have his grace. So don't think about this as something where God's being unfair and unjust. No, God is giving people what they want. But for those who want him, for those who surrender to him, oh my goodness, what we have to look forward to is, is beyond description. It's beyond description. So now let's go back and look at more words of Jesus. And by the way, in case you would like to do more reading on this whole idea of the, the rapture and, and it happening at the end and no secret rapture taking place, here's a great resource I can recommend to you, Not Afraid of the Antichrist, Why We Don't Believe in a Pre-Trib Rapture by Michael Brown and Craig Keener. Uh, both of them are scholars, especially Keener. So if you want to check that out, read it on your own, great. And if you say, Pastor, I totally disagree with you. I believe in this rapture before the tribulation. I hope you're right. And on the way up, I'll high five you and, and I'll say, you're right, I was wrong. But hold it loosely. Lest we go through tribulation, increasing tribulation, you become disillusioned. And somebody tells you, oh, you missed it out. You were left behind. See, it's, this idea of the pre-trib rapture is an 1800s theology. The early church fathers didn't believe it or hold to it. And it's very American. It's this idea that somehow we deserve not to have to go through persecution. While in fact, in China, in North Korea, in many parts of the world, they are living the great tribulation. They can't buy, they can't sell. They have to hide. They're being persecuted. They're being imprisoned. Why should we think that somehow we are exempt from that ourselves? Now look what Jesus says. For as were the days of Noah, so will, be, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man as it was in the days of Noah. You know, Peter tells us that, that Noah preached righteousness during those 60 or 70 years of ark building, of waiting for the flood. He preached righteousness by his life, by his words. But people just didn't, weren't interested. They wanted nothing to do with it. They wanted their life their way. And then the flood came. And Jesus goes on that passage. You can read it toward the end of the Olivet Discourse and says, look, it's going to be like two men working in the field. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two women grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. That's not speaking about the rapture. I mean, you want to be the one who's left. The one who's taken, that's judgment. The people are swept away by the flood, but God kept Noah and the ark and his family. There's coming a harvest. Some will be taken away to judgment. Some will be taken up to meet the Lord, transformed, and come to rule and reign with him here on this earth. That's the promise that lays in front of us. That's what we have to look forward to, is being resurrected, being transformed, and ruling and reigning with Christ when he comes. Do you believe he's going to come? Do you believe he's going to reign and rule someday and you and I are going to rule and reign with him? Do you believe that in your hearts? I believe it in my heart. I believe that day is coming. But I also believe this. 
that as that day approaches, we are going to see an increase of rebellion towards God. And listen carefully, not just a rebellion towards God, but for everything and everyone who represents God. And so we're going to see increased persecution in the days ahead. The world is going to turn toward a different type of God, a different type of religion, a different type of belief. And I'm going to be talking to you about that in a couple of weeks when we end our series on the issue of persecution and some interesting things that are taking place and the possibility of artificial intelligence and, and what's happening there to create a religion, a human religion, a human solution for the problems that we are facing that has no room for God and no room for his word. But we'll get there in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, next weekend, I want to talk to you about heaven. Because, you know, you got to get a picture of what you have to look forward to. It helps a lot sometimes in order to endure what you're going through. It's like in athletics, it's like running a race. Man, you can get so weary running that race. Or I was a wrestler. It's like you've got six minutes or depending on the season, it might be, it might be nine minutes of wrestling. And you get weary and you get tired. But knowing it's going to end and knowing there's a trophy or a medal waiting for you, a celebration, makes it worthwhile grinding it out, so to speak. And I want you to know what's ahead of you. Whether, it's, whether you die and the Lord doesn't return, I want you to know what paradise is going to be like as you wait. I want you to know what heaven is going to be like. I want you to know what it's like for your loved ones, what it's going to be like for you. So we're going to be so pumped up and encouraged next weekend. We're going to get excited about what we have to look forward to. But, but before we do that, I want to leave you with some encouraging words. Because, you know, these are, these are difficult times. These are heavy times right now. And there's a lot of political disappointment. There's a lot of um, uh, social disappointment. There's a lot of controversy. There's a lot of division. There's a lot of conspiracy. There's a lot of conjecture. I mean, I want you to be encouraged. And I want to encourage you by closing this message with some words that I read this week that really spoke deeply to my heart. And they're the words of Jesus to his disciples who were facing incredibly difficult days, hearing that he's going to die, that he's going to lead them, that, that it's not going to be the kingdom they thought it was going to be. And look what Jesus says to them. And then these words just jumped out at me. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. He said, it's going to be tribulation, but I want you to know I'm leaving you with a gift. And the gift is peace of mind and heart. If you back up to uh, John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Now, they're living in troubling times. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. He said, I'm giving you this amazing gift. I'm giving you a peace of mind and heart. And so the, what I heard God saying to me is, is your heart troubled right now? And my heart's been very troubled. Do you have peace of mind and peace of heart? I've been struggling that peace of mind and peace of heart. Maybe you feel the same thing too. And the conviction that came to me, and I can only speak for myself, you'll have to decide if it applies to you or not, is I felt God saying to me, Dale, you are looking for your peace of mind and heart from the world. And he's never going to give it to you. You're looking for a peace of mind of heart from the political world. It's not going to come to you. A politician's not going to give that to you. A party's not going to give that to you. The culture's not going to give that to you. Entertainment's not going to give that to you. Money is not going to give that to you. You had all the history to prove that. But I can give it to you. I need your focus, Dale, totally on me. And that's what God, I think, is saying to all of us, especially as believers. Hey, listen, stop, time out. I mean, I wish I could take all of you on a retreat with me for a weekend. I really do. All of us. And just do a time out and say, look, what does Jesus say? Don't be troubled. And maybe we would repent from allowing ourselves to be troubled by this world. Repent from looking for a political Messiah, from looking, you know, for the world, society, culture to bring us peace. Jesus said the world is not going to give you peace. The peace the world offers you is very temporary. He says, look, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. 
So don't be troubled. He says it again, or afraid. Read 14, 16. Don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm giving you peace. Not as the world gives. Remember what I told you, he said. I'm going away, yes, but I will come back to you again. If you really love me, you would be happy that I'm going to the Father who is greater than I am. I have told you these things before they happen so that when they happen, you will believe. It's happening. Do you believe? Do you believe? Don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. Draw your peace from your relationship with Christ. Draw your peace from the fact that you know where you're going. Draw your peace because you know how the story ends. But we're kind of back to our original question. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Let's pray. God, I ask for myself, I ask for my friends, give us the peace that passes understanding. God, help us to stop being so troubled by the world. Help us to stop being fearful of the world. Lord, help us to put our eyes on you alone. We receive your peace. We receive our hope. We receive our forgiveness. We roll our sleeves up, God. We see ourselves not as victims, but as victors. We are see ourselves not here to condemn and hate the world, but to love this world into eternity. We've got a mission here, Father to tell the people there's good news in a bad news world. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next weekend.